Okay. We are going to learn about um, intervals of increasing and decreasing um, using first derivative tests today. So it's just an addition to taking derivatives and some application to using derivatives. So there's this idea behind the first derivative test and saying that you can actually determine where a function is increasing or decreasing. So, you know, you used to be able to look at a function like this. And let's say this is a point one and let's say this is a point three. And you would say, all right, well, my function is from the left to the right. It's increasing from negative infinity to one. Negative infinity to one. And then it's decreasing. And we did this in pre-calc from one to three. And then it goes back to increasing from three to infinity. Well, we're going to do that same thing, but we're going to use derivatives to figure it out. And why is that? Because if you notice all the slopes right here where I'm increasing, almost all of them are positive slopes. And then there comes a point where there's a zero slope. And then the slopes become negative. And then it becomes zero and then it becomes positive. And that's what the first derivative test is going to tell us. So if I take first derivative of a function and that happens to be greater than zero, which means it's positive for all x in the interval of i, then the function must be increasing. If my derivative is positive, it's greater than zero, I'm increasing right here. The derivative is greater than zero of those tangent lines. If it's negative, for all x in the interval i, then f of x is decreasing. And then if it's zero, for all x in the interval i, then f of x is just constant at that point. It's a constant slope. Now let's look at a couple of graphs here and kind of really talk through this. Again, there's this idea of right now my function is increasing and eventually there's this point where it switches from increasing to then decreasing. So that point is important. And then it does the same thing right here. It switches from decrease to an increase. Even right here, if you remember what this is called, this was called a cusp. We can't take a derivative at that point though. That's still an important point. These points right here are important where they switch from increasing to decreasing. Even this cusp. In a picture like this, it looks like it's increasing the entire time, but there's definitely some kind of little dip in the picture. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. So what are these points called? These are called critical points. And critical points are any number, we'll call it C, any number C, where if I take the derivative of a function and I plug C into it, I should get out zero or it should not exist because it's probably a cusp. And we're going to use this information to actually help us find where a function is increasing or decreasing. So here's a couple of helpful hints to determine if a function is increasing or decreasing in on tonight's homework. So the first thing you want to do is locate critical points, meaning you want to take a derivative. Hello, that's what we've been doing. Set it equal to zero. Find those critical points. That's what you do when you take a derivative and set it equal to zero. Then you're going to determine the signs of the function. You're going to do what's called a sign test, if you remember. It's not that hard, though. And then you're going to write your answers in interval notation. Actually, you're going to do it on an open interval notation, meaning you don't need brackets. Okay? So let's do our first example here. 
find the open intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing for f of x equals x cubed minus 6x squared. So the first thing you want to do is take a derivative. So the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Derivative of 6x squared is minus 12x. Set it equal to 0. Take a derivative, set it equal to 0. Let's see if we can factor anything out. We can factor out a 3x. We're left with x minus 4 equals 0. And then my critical points would be if I set this equal to 0, I get x to be 0 and x to be 4. Okay. So now you're going to draw a number line with those critical points on it, 0 and 4. And you're going to do <clears throat> what's called a sign test, okay? So if these are my critical points, these are like those bumps in the graph. And so I want to see what's happening before the bump and after the bump. And so what I do is I pick a point inside of this interval right here. So you pick a point like pick x to be negative 1. And you're going to plug it into the derivative because that's what a critical point is. I can determine if my derivative is greater than 0, then I know it's increasing. If my derivative is less than 0, then I know it's decreasing. So I'm going to pick like negative 1. I'm going to plug it right here and here. So negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. So you don't really even need the number. You just need the sign. So negative right here, and then negative 1 minus 4 is still negative. Well, two negatives make it positive. So it is increasing in this interval. And honestly, since this is a three zone, all three zones usually go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So if this is plus, this is going to be minus, which means it's going to be decreasing. And this one is going to be plus, which means it's going to be increasing. And so now you write your intervals and you say, OK, I am increasing from negative infinity up to zero and from four to infinity. And then this section of X is where I'm decreasing from zero to four. And that's how you do interval using derivatives. All right. Now, let's talk about the first derivative test. So first derivative test says that if the derivative of f changes from a positive to a negative, watch, from a positive to a negative, then that point right there, that point at C, then f of C has to be what's called a local max. I think last year we called it a relative max, but relative max, local max are the same. So if it changes from increasing to decreasing, you have a relative max, a local max. Well, what if it goes the other way? Well, if it changes from decreasing to increasing, decreasing to increasing, then that is a local min. Now, if it doesn't change at all, if it has the same sign, meaning if it goes from increasing to increasing or decreasing to decreasing, you can't then, you can't say anything about it right now. It could be something tomorrow, which is like point of inflection, but it doesn't have, it has neither a local max or a local min. So this is where the first derivative comes into play. It helps us find some local extrema. So let's do an example of this. Find the local extrema. So we're still going to do exactly what we just did before on the previous problem. We're still going to locate some critical points and determine signs. Okay, so we're going to do that first. So take a derivative. So this is a U problem, remember. So we're going to have two thirds in front. This is our U. To the minus one would be to the negative one third times this chain. Oops, I didn't mean to write equals times the chain, which is 2x. Now, you do have to clean this up. You have to make it look like a nice one single fraction. So the 2 and the 2x are in the numerator, 4x. The 3 is in the bottom. 
And then this goes to the bottom because it has a negative exponent. Let's make it a positive exponent in the bottom. So this is my derivative. To find your critical points with a fraction like this, you would set the top equal to zero and the bottom equal to zero because remember, where you're undefined could also be a critical point. It could be like a cusp. So we're just going to set 4x equal to zero, the top, and we're going to set the bottom equal to zero. So that's easy. That means zero is a critical point. And then this one, if I divide over three and if I, you know, raise it to a third power, really I'm just looking to see when will this be zero. And that will be at two and negative two. All right, so let's make our number line. Plot these critical points. So negative two, zero. Two. And we're going to do our sign test. Same thing before. OK, so we're going to pick a number that comes before negative two. So let's pick like negative five. So if I pick negative five and I put it into the derivative, put it into the derivative. That would be negative on top. But negative five squared would be positive. You'd have a positive on the bottom. So really, you're just going to have negative in this section, which is decreasing. And then pick negative one. Negative one would be negative on top. But negative one into the bottom right here would actually still, this would make one minus four, which is negative three to the one third, would still be negative. So negative on top and a negative on bottom make a positive, which means you are increasing. And you keep doing this. And I'm just going to tell you it goes decreasing and then it goes increasing again, but you can check it. So what does that mean? Well, at this point right here, negative two, if you go from decrease to increase, decrease to increase, you must have a relative min. What about at zero? Zero, I went from an increase to a decrease, increase to a decrease. I must have a max, relative max. And then last but not least, decrease to increase again, I have another relative min. So for my final answers here, I would write my intervals. I would be increasing from negative two to zero and from two to infinity. I would be decreasing from negative infinity to negative two and from zero to two. So there's your intervals. And then I have two relative mins. And you're going to write the coordinates for this. So these are the x values, negative 2. We need to find the y values, and 2. And how do I ever find a y value? I plug into the original to find y. Plug it into the original. So if I put negative two in there and square it, minus four, you're gonna get zero. Same with two. These are relative mints. For your relative max, you're gonna plug zero in and tell me what that y value will be. And I'll just give you the decimal. It's like 2.54. You can leave it exact or. But see, it's just one extra step to what you've been doing. It's literally now just telling me if you go from an increase to a decrease, you have a max. Decrease to increase, you have a min. And then just telling me where those points are at. All right, one last thing. What about absolute extrema? Well, absolute extrema occurs on really closed and open intervals. More, more than likely it occurs on closed. I want to show you some example. So if I have a picture like this where I have this closed section right here to here. This would be your absolute max. And this would be your absolute min. Makes sense. But if they're open, I don't know what the absolute max would be because this is open. I can't really get close enough to it. But I could find an absolute min. 
And notice where that absolute min is occurring. It's occurring at a critical point. I could have a picture like this where I don't necessarily know the absolute min, but again, because this is closed, I do know an absolute max. So here's the whole point of absolute extrema. They have to occur on endpoints or at a critical point. They occur on the endpoints of an interval or at a critical point. So let's do an example. Determine the absolute extrema on the interval 0 to 4 for the function x cubed minus 3x squared. So once again, we're going to take a derivative. 3x squared minus 6x. We're going to set it equal to 0 because we want to find that critical point. So it looks like I have two critical points at 0 and 2. Well, you definitely want to check to see that these are inside this interval that they gave you. Are those inside that interval? Yes. Now, if they weren't, let's say you had like negative five as one of your critical points, you won't even test it. Don't even test it. Once you get these critical points, I would make then a table like this. You have to put your endpoints because again, absolutes occur at endpoints. So you have to put your endpoints. So I go zero and then I leave some space and I go four. And then you put any of the critical points in between. So two would be in between. And you're going to find the Y values. Now, again, how do you find Y values? You plug them into the original. So if I plug zero into this function right here, I get zero. If I have two into that function, I get negative four. And if I plug four into the function, I get 16. And you can check me on that, but that's what they are. Use your calculator, plug them into the original. Again, find Y into the original. So then out of these three numbers, which one of those is your absolute min? Yeah, negative four is the absolute min. And so you say there's an absolute min of negative four at X equal to two. And then which one is your max? This one. Absolute max of 16 at x equals 4. And that's it. I hope this helps you today. See you tomorrow.